There was a man who lived in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. Welcome to our study of the living messages of the book of Job. Job is one of the favorite books of many in the Bible because it teaches us how that God will take care of and see His children through times of suffering. Key words in the book of Job would include the idea of suffering or trial or even perseverance. Do you remember James 5 verse 11? James says, consider the suffering or the perseverance of Job and of course the sovereignty of God. That God is sovereign, He is supreme, and that in all His decisions and in all His ways God is right even when those may not look right to man. Key verses in the book of Job that portray the key ideas, central ideas of this book, you find in Job 1 verse 9, really, a central problem in the book, Satan asks God, will a man serve God for nothing? And of course, Job is the divine answer to that question, for in Job 13, 15, Job says, though he slay me, Yet will I trust Him. And so, will man serve God just because He's God? Take away all the blessings, all the privileges, all the promises. And will He serve God because God is worthy of our devotion and service? And of course, Job answers in the affirmative, showing that a man will serve God for nothing. I love the words of Job 23, verse 12. Such a central idea found here. Job said of God's Word that it was more necessary than our food that we eat every day. God's Word is more necessary or more important than our daily food. And then, of course, Job 1 verse 1 and Job 1 verses 21 and 22. Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, key, key chapters as we try to get an idea around this book, some of the key chapters that we'll find are chapters 1 and chapter 42. In chapter 1, we have the plot unfolding as Satan now begins to use his resources and tools available to him to bring suffering to Job. His wealth, his family, his own health, tempting Job to curse God. But in chapter 42, as Job has endured that persecution and trial, all is now restored by God even more than Job initially had. And then as we think about the book of Job, this book, it's been loved by many because it has helped them through the valley of the shadow of death and suffering. Uh, let me illustrate. Victor Hugo once said of the book of Job, Tomorrow, if all literature was to be destroyed, and it was left to me to retain only one work, I should save Job. Daniel Webster said of the book of Job, Taken as a mere work of literary genius, it is one of the most wonderful productions of any age or of any language. And of course, Philip Schaff, great student of the Bible, said the book of Job rises like a pyramid in the history of literature without a predecessor and without a rival. And thus, we think about some of the practical lessons in this great book. What is the central message in the book of Job? Many think that that suffering is really the, the central idea and that the book of Job is all about how to address and how to deal with the problem of suffering. I don't think that's really what Job is about because if the book of Job is about suffering, God never tells Job why and how to deal with and how to overcome that suffering. You see Job learn some of those problems, but that's not necessarily the main idea of the book. Job's suffering is only a cause of the real theme in the book. What is this real theme that God is trying to address? Here's the message of Job. Satan brings an accusation to God. Will a man serve God for nothing? Well, people, in, in essence, Satan says to God, people only serve you 
for what they can get out of it. And so we're in serving God because of all that God gives us. And so in essence, Satan makes this accusation against God. People only follow you because you shower them with your blessings. And so that's the accusation that Satan makes. Remember Job chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Notice these words. Satan says of Job, have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. And so God says, what about Job? And Satan says, Job, he only follows you because of what you've blessed him with. And so Satan's question is, does Job fear God for nothing? And of course, this is the key question, I believe, in understanding the book of Job. Will men serve God just because He's God? And so how do we figure that out? Is righteousness apart from the blessings possible? Now we bring up Job as the prime example that men will serve God apart from the blessings. Well, how do we prove that? God says, let's take Job my servant as an example. I'm going to give you limited power over him. You can take away his possessions. You can take away certain things, only don't harm his person. Does all that. How does Job respond? Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Still doesn't curse God. And, and so Satan comes back and says, well, he's still got certain blessings in essence. And God says, I'm going to give you power to touch his person now. You just can't take his life. And so now Satan afflicts Job with this horrible, dreaded disease. And even his wife encourages him, you need to stay around, you need to curse God and die. And he says to her, you sound like one of the foolish women. Shall we indeed receive good from God and not bad adversity? And so he says, I'm not going to curse God and die. And throughout the book, this shows us that God can be served because of who He is. As we think about the divine plot unfolding in the book of Job and its message for us today, and as we read and study this book, what can we walk away with that will help us to be more faithful to God, trust Him more, and live the Christian life even better? Well, here are some of the practical lessons that we do learn out of the book of Job. Number one, Let's realize that life is so brief. Job chapter 14 verse 1 says, Man who is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. Now I understand Job is in the throes of depression. He's in the throes of uh, uh, suffering and anguish. And yet he makes a valid point here that man who is born of woman, it is of few days. Friend, I've not been promised, nor have you, that we're going to live and last forever. In fact, we've been promised just the opposite. Psalm 90 verses 10 through 12 says of man that three score and ten, maybe four score, seventy, maybe eighty years, if we're lucky. The Bible says in James 4 and verse 14, what is your life? It is but a vapor. Here for a little while, and then it vanishes away. And I'm reminded of the words of 2 Samuel 14, verse 14. David said, Life is like a glass of water, like a cup of water. Once it's poured out, cannot be drawn back up again. Psalm 144 and verse 4, Life is like a shadow or a passing very quickly by man. And so when we think about life, let's realize that our life, is so brief and let, let's make the most of this life. Let's not let anything but God rule our life. You know, Job, he, he realized very quickly that life was brief and yet he still trusted in the Almighty. My friends, that's what we need to do today. Even though our life may be brief, let's make sure that in this life we're trusting in God and we're putting first things first. If my life is brief, then how that reminds me that I, I need to make sure I have my priorities where they need to be. Jesus asked two questions in Mark 8, verse 36 and 37. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? 
Are you really seeking first the kingdom of God? Matthew 6, 33. Can you say, as Paul did, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain? Philippians 1, 21. Whether you eat or whether you drink, are you doing all to the glory of God? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. A second very practical lesson that we learn from the book of Job is there is life beyond the grave. Job asked a question in Job 14, verse 14, which we really don't find an answer to until a little later in the New Testament. Job asked, If a man dies, shall he live again? But what is the answer to that? Is this life all that there is? To some it must be, because their whole focus and their whole emphasis in this life is all about the here and now. If we're living for money and pleasure and worldliness, aren't we living just for the here and now? But what about the other side? Is there more than just this life? You bet there is. Jesus said in John 11, verse 25 and 26, that there was more to life than just here. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, Jesus said, he'll never really die. Do you remember Jesus' words in John 5, verse 28 and 29? Jesus said, all who are in the graves will one day come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Jesus clearly taught there was something beyond the grave. The righteous will go away into everlasting life. Matthew 25, verse 46. And yet we learn there is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Luke chapter 16, where the cowardly and the ungodly will live forever. Revelation 21, verse 8. And so since life is brief, are we really focusing on the eternal? Friend, it's so easy sometimes to get caught up in what's going on right now that we lose sight of what's really important. My soul and your soul are the most important things we have. Are we preparing those to live with God in eternity? And then I love the words of Job 19.25. Another very practical lesson is learned from the book of Job. Job asks as he thinks about his own suffering, and as he thinks about his own plight, he's looking for someone to bring his plight, bring his case before God in essence. And Job makes this great statement, I know that my Redeemer lives. Job was looking for a Redeemer to help him with his current plight and situation. But how much more for the child of God? Don't we know that our Redeemer lives today to, to, to redeem? is to buy something back. A price necessarily has to be paid. And friend, that price was paid by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Well, what was that great price when Jesus suffered and died and gave His life on Calvary? He paid the ultimate price as a ransom to buy us back from God or from the captivity we found ourselves in due to sin. Galatians 1 and verse 4. And thus we have the great Redeemer. You know, as we think about the book of Job, another very powerful lesson emerges from this great text found in Job chapter 23 and verse 12. I want you to notice what Job says in the midst of his suffering and trials in Job chapter 23. Job says these words. Job states, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. How important is the Word of God to each Christian? You know, when we think about Job's predicament and the peril he finds himself in, lost his family, lost his total wealth, loses his own health, begins to consider his relationship with God and wonders why all this is happening, and yet in the midst of that, Job says, I've not departed from God's commandments. His Word I've treasured more than my necessary food. How important is the Word of God to each one of us. 
Jesus said in Matthew 5 verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 15 verse 16, Your words were found, and I did eat them, and they were to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Do we have that, that mentality that we're hungry for the Word of God, that when we find it, we want to spiritually consume it and make it a part of our life? As Jesus faced great trial and suffering at the hand of the devil, He used the most powerful tool He could think of in overcoming Him. And friend, that tool was the Word of God. Jesus was tempted by Satan after He'd been in the wilderness 40 days, no doubt. He was hungry. He was tempted by Satan. If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 4 verse 4? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Friend, let's make sure that like Job, this book, the Bible, is where we get our sustenance from. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, 105. Earlier in that chapter, he said in Psalm 119, verses 10 through 12, Your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And so we need the courage to trust God's word even when the situation isn't always rosy. I can know. God's sovereign. He's in control. If I trust Him, He'll see that I'm taken care of. Another very powerful lesson that we learn from the book of Job, and, and this is one that we need to be reminded of regularly. We have an aggressive, militant enemy who will stop at nothing to reach his goal of causing men and women to be lost. I want you to think about the aggressive nature of Satan. Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, we see God and the sons of God coming before God and, and Satan also appears and God asks Satan this question, where have you come from? And his answer is, I've been going to and fro, back and forth on the earth. Well, what, what was he doing down there? The very next question of God tells us what he was doing. Have you considered my servant Job? Satan was going to and fro, back and forth on the earth, looking actively, aggressively, looking for men and women to tempt. That's the picture we see in every scenario about Satan in the Bible. Consider these pictures in Scripture. Genesis chapter 3, Satan is likened unto a wily, cunning serpent, lying in wait for the perfect moment to strike. We move a little further forward in the New Testament. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, you see his aggressive, destructive nature. He's like a roaring lion. Consider your adversary the devil. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And then think about the power that he has. He's described as that, that great dragon, that serpent of old in Revelation chapter 12. One thing you can be certain of. Satan isn't wasting any time. He's not sitting around being lazy. He's actively, aggressively trying to tempt men and women so that they can be lost. But is there any hope in this then? Well, sure there is. 1 Peter 5 verse 7 says, As Christians, we can overcome Him, resist Him. 1 Peter 5 verses 7 through 9, Resist Him steadfast in the faith with God's help. I have the power to resist Satan. You remember Luke 22, 32? Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith would not fail or falter. And so with God's help and with power in the Word of God and knowing that I can resist him in the faith, friend, there is help for the child of God to resist the enemy. Let's notice another powerful lesson from the book of Job, and it's this. Sometimes the Lord does give, and the Lord does take away. Do you remember Job chapter 1? I want you to listen to the words again of Job chapter 1, verse 21. Job has just lost his children to a great destruction and devastation. Job has lost his 
financial wealth, his cattle, and all that he had to thievery. And now look what Job says in Job chapter 1, verse 21. Job says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gives, and the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Look at Job chapter 2 and verse number 10. The Bible says, Job speaking to his wife, but he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. I need to realize that in this life, there are going to be times of plenty, and there are going to be times probably of poverty. There are going to be times when we're on the mountaintop, and there are going to be times we're in the valley. And we need to realize that in all those times, that doesn't necessarily mean that we've been separated from God, but that we need to examine the situation, look into our own life, make sure that we're living right, and then do our best, even in the difficulties, to trust God. Do you remember James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4? James said, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. When I face those difficulties, when I have those trials that come into my life, I need to realize that God, He knows what I'm going through. God knows and God cares. Cast all your cares upon Him. He cares for you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 7. Let's notice then another very practical message from the book of Job, and it's as we've simply mentioned, no matter what, Trust God. Trust God implicitly, even when things don't always look good, even when I may not know the reason why. Like Job, struggled greatly, suffered as much as any man's probably ever suffered, even to the brink of death, and yet Job trusted God implicitly. I want you to hear again the words of Job 13, 15. Job said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job was dying, he felt like. Every day, no doubt, he was getting weaker. He was suffering more. And yet, all of this because he was proving that a man would serve God for nothing. And even in the midst of all that, Job said, although it may be God who slay me, it feels like it anyway, I'm going to trust Him. Friend, that's the kind of trust that each of us needs today. Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Let your life be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For He Himself has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? Do we really have that type of faith that we can trust God even when things aren't going well? in our life? Do, do we have the type of faith that we can put our trust in Him and know that God will provide for us and that we can trust God even when things are getting more difficult and even when the challenges of life are being thrown at us? And so we must always look to God as the great source of our faith. Remember Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Let's put our trust in the Almighty and let's make sure that we do follow God just as Job did. Remember again what happened to Job as he suffered so much. Family loss, financial loss, great health loss. His wife stays and tells him to curse God and die. He has to deal with a lot of things emotionally, physically, psychologically. And yet, as Job persevered, James 5, verse 11, look at Job chapter 42. God restores what Job has lost, blesses him manyfold on top of what he had, and yet God is the one who comes out looking like men will serve him and men do serve him for nothing. And so let's ask ourselves, why, why am I a Christian? Am I a Christian because of 
what I believe I can get out of it. Now, don't get me wrong. The Bible says in Ephesians 1 verse 3, all spiritual blessings are ours in Christ Jesus. But am I a Christian because of what I think I can get out of Christianity? You know, we raise a society of people who are standing with their hand out saying, what can you give me? And I wonder sometimes if people aren't in Christianity for what they can get out of it. Friend, let's realize that our purest, deepest motive for serving God must simply be He's God and He deserves it. And so we ask you to consider your life. Consider your faith. Consider the events that have happened in your life and my life. And let's see if we've really been true to the Almighty as Job has. Friend, we ask you today to consider your own faithfulness to the Lord. Are you a child of God? Have you obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Are you a Christian? The Bible says that to become a child of God, you must hear the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. Having heard that Word, you must believe that Jesus is God's Son. John 8, 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. Having believed that Jesus is the great Redeemer, we then need to repent of sin. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Having repented of those wrongs in our life, we must make that good confession. Acts chapter 8 verse 37 through 39. And as Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Friend, have you obeyed the gospel? If not, we encourage you to today. If maybe as a child of God, at one time you were faithful, and yet you faced a lot of suffering, and you faced a lot of difficulty, and, and life came tumbling down on you, and, and maybe you blame God. Let's realize there are a lot of other reasons for the problems and sufferings we face besides God. Instead of blaming God, let's take the time to honor and worship Him as the Almighty, as He so greatly deserves. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.